everyone. Welcome to the CultCast. I'm your host, Dr. Anna Johnson, Vice President of Corporate Development and Marketing at United States Cold Storage. And today we have an awesome show for you. We've got my good friend and colleague, Marty Steinmetz, here with us to talk about everything cold chain, from food manufacturing trends to what we're doing to address labor and capacity constraints in our industry. It's going to be an exciting show, and we are really passionate about this podcast because we want to show you guys our love for the cold chain and give you knowledge and best practices to show how we're progressing the cold chain forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Marty Steinmetz. He is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships here at U.S. Cold, and he's been here for 15 years, but in the industry for over 25 years. Marty and I have worked together for the past eight years here at U.S. Cold. Uh, we were together at AmeriCold, and I'd love to introduce you guys to him and hear a little bit about what he thinks of the cold chain. So, Marty, you know, right now, cold storage is hot. Absolutely. And we're coming Absolutely. into the fall um, season, and that's when, you know, all the shippers are shipping out their products, trying to get food to the consumers. What is it doing to capacity in the industry? Well, I think, I mean, you've got two kinds of capacity. So we've got space capacity, which mm -hmm. is a big concern, and we can talk about that. But then you've just got volume capacity. So being able to get trucks in and out just from a mm -hmm. standpoint of how much labor is involved is going to be just as, as crazy this year as it was last year, if not even busier. We're starting to see a lot of manufacturers at the peak of the appointments that they need. They're trying to actually get inventory out to the retailers and the food service providers a little bit earlier than normal. I mean, if you look at 2019, probably yep. some of the busiest you know, the warehouse have seen the, the storage capacity was was at really at a peak. We're mm -hmm. seeing more and more uh, companies getting into the cold storage business. They're saying, oh, my gosh, there's extra uh, need to build mm -hmm. additional distribution centers. And I mean, that comes first of all, we kind of have to look at what caused that and then how that changed during the pandemic. Right. And then how are we coming out of it after the pandemic? So what do you think started that? So I think when you when you look at 2017, 18, 19, you look at the impact of you know, Walmart, Kroger, a lot of the folks that came out with fines. So this on time in full and the impact of I've got to put more inventory in a closer facility. to the yep. customer, the end customer, mm -hmm. the retailer in this particular case. Mm -hmm. If I get it closer to them, I've got less of a chance to be late for an order. I have less of a chance I'm going to short the order. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I'm going to reduce my fine. So we we saw literally the impact of ODIF actually impact. Explode warehousing yep. throughout both and that's not just temp control that's also in dry but especially in the food world mm -hmm. that's where we've seen it and then so that's kind of what led up to the pandemic so we're we're full 2019 mm -hmm. things are rolling well from a labor standpoint things were fairly right. smooth and then march hit um we had a lot of people throughout the industry u.s cold included that you didn't have as many workers mm -hmm. come to work right you had a lot of people working you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week mm -hmm. just to get product out the door. Well, meanwhile, manufacturers, they couldn't, Same they couldn't thing. manufacture, right. right? So their plants. So all we saw were, so did we have issues in 2020 with space? Not really. It was all about the labor. Do we have enough labor to keep turning mm -hmm. this product over and over? And as soon as it hit our doors, we were shipping it back out. Mm -hmm. And as we go into 2021, in some ways, we actually had more labor challenges because, you know, it started to stabilize in some regard but we still were not able as an industry to probably handle the peaks, the, the days of turning trucks in two hours, you know, having kind of that efficient supply chain mm -hmm. from a warehousing and transportation perspective. It's just now starting to get a little bit smoother this year. And then, Oh, guess what? Now we've got the fall and it's going to get hectic like it always does. Right. Right. And so what do you think, how do you think the third party logistics cold chain companies handled those labor shortages? Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, when you look at the short term, it was, mm -hmm. you know, all about overtime. I think we actually did a great job and, and you, you got to applaud the people. You know, we all thank doctors and nurses and everybody that yeah. were on the front lines. But when you think of the impact of truck drivers that were out there every single day walking in places mm -hmm. uh, when we didn't really know what the impact of COVID was. So, right. you know, definitely applaud the workers that did show up and worked six and seven days a week, right. many, many weeks in a row. So and I think they went into their warehouse. They went into those places while a lot of, you know, the, a lot of America stayed at home in their home offices. Right. And they ordered online mm -hmm. or they had the food delivered to them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was, a, it was, you know, definitely a time our in industry stood up, mm -hmm. you know, st stood up and, and took a stand and say, you know what, this, our industry matters. We've mm -hmm. got to do this. But I think as we go forward, we know that, since 2019, we don't have the same workforce that we had before. We don't have as many people signing up yep. to say, 
you know, we, we, we've known for years there's a truck driver shortage. People aren't saying, hey, I want to, you know, I want to drive a truck right. the rest of my life. They think it's cool and yeah. let's, let's always pull the, act like we're honking the horn in our car on family vacation <laughs> next to a trucker. But is that something you really want to do for the rest of your life? So right. we've seen that in warehousing. And again, we're cold storage, so it's even tougher. Um, so I think we've had to be very creative to attract new people to it. Right. Uh, we've definitely made huge advancements in the pay. Uh, but that's when you see really the push for automation, it, both in warehousing. And then then the next question is, okay, yes, we've got to automate. Do we automate the full pallet stuff? Do we automate the case pick stuff? But those are all challenges that we're, you know, we're definitely working through right now. Right. And it depends on the type of warehouse you're in, the customers. Um, so when you think about customers and where that, ca- that, where that automation really can come into play and help us out as an industry, where do you think it's most valuable? You know, I think when we've done recent studies, I mean, case picking, you know, is sometimes 50, 60% of our total handling costs. So when you think of, okay, I'm bringing pallets in the door, I'm putting them away, I'm, you know, pulling pallets out of the racks, loading trucks, mm-hmm. that's enough labor in itself. But to think of all the, the man hours that are placed going down each aisle, right. just hand stacking boxes and boxes. In a cold environment. In a cold environment. So you, you think, well, they can't stay in there for two hours straight or three right. hours straight between breaks. So you've got to even, you've got to factor that in as well. So, you know, it's gotten to the point where as an industry, we've kind of learned to say, listen, this is a big deal. We've got to do something about it. And sure, we can change prices. We can do things to mm-hmm. impact it. But at the end of the day, there's got to be a change on both sides of the supply chain. Have we, have you seen a rise in case pick volumes? You know, I would say in the, in the profile, I'm going to say in the last couple of months, I've started to see some retailers start to actually push back from mm-hmm. that. So I've actually seen a slight decrease. I would tell you from 2017 through 2020, when the pandemic hit, the mm-hmm. case bit continued to rise and the customers Absolutely. that you would think, you know, those in constant like a Walmart, you think, well, it's Walmart. They're getting all Why full would they take, Yeah. But because of, you know, whether Manufa- it's... A- right. Manufa- manufacturing shortages. So maybe they could, could mm-hmm. ship a full pallet, things like that. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, even 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 before that, even before we had some, you know, issues with the pandemic, mm-hmm. you still had the focus on, I'm just going to order half a pallet twice a week instead of right. just ordering a full pallet. So now, but if you're Wegmans, if you're ShopRite or Acme or any of these other mm-hmm. grocery chains, um, you know, Kroger, Walmart, it's a, it's a lot of labor for them mm-hmm. to actually... They might have lumpers, but at the end of the day, right. it's still time on their dock, right? So instead of taking that full pallet, taking three layers today and three layers mm-hmm. tomorrow, you know, it's it's a huge burden for them. So we're hoping as a supply chain, especially with all the challenges we're all facing, right. this isn't just a third party PRW problem. Mm-hmm. It's not a dry warehouse. It's not just, it's, we're all in this together. Right. So how do we eliminate all those touches? So I think, you know, that's one of the ways that if, if there's continued communication with both the manufacturers mm-hmm. and the end customers, the retailers, the food service providers, there's always going to be some case pick, but I don't think there's been enough effort. There hasn't been enough costs associated with it. And if you think of it, you know, from an industry standpoint, so much of the case pick dollars are kind of being subsidized by other revenue streams. What, maybe do, you mean by, what do you mean by that? So, you know, there's a, there's a monthly rent, if you mm-hmm. will, a rate from a storage standpoint that they're paying. There's a there's a rate to actually handle the product to unload the truck and, and and load the truck back out and then you've got a separate charge to case pick it. For so many years, if we actually went in and did an activity based costing on mm-hmm. what each function costs, you know, case pick would be through the roof. Storage might be lower, handling might be higher or lower depending on the activity, the size of the cases. But for so long as an industry, we've just kind of looked at it and said, hey, this covers it. So right. as case pick continued to spiral up. It's, it got to the point it wasn't covering mm-hmm. it. So I think that as an industry, that's one of those things we've got to do. And if we don't have those genuine conversations with our manufacturing customers who have those conversations with their retailers, um, we're going to continue to see this. And I, you know, I, I was talking to one of our manufacturing partners last week and, and said, you know, we're really, you know, as we look at rate adjustments and the impact of, of inflation and the, mm-hmm. you know, CPI and what it's done to our costs, you know, we've got to start being smarter how we do that. And the response I got back was, you know what? We understand if, if your pain is in the case picking, mm-hmm. that's probably what needs to change instead of changing everything. Because if, if you can change it in the case picking, if you can change how that's priced from an industry standpoint, now we can go back to our customers mm-hmm. and have that conversation with them. And that way, if it truly is a pain to find labor to case pick cases, mm-hmm. and you tell me it's going to cost up here instead of down here to, to mm-hmm. you know, to pick cases, right. 
well, then I'm going to do something and I, maybe I can eliminate some of that completely. So even though the cost per case might be a lot higher, right. I'm going to reduce those cases and in theory, maybe have a chance to keep their costs more flat just on that impact. Do you think that the retailers are going to be more receptive to hear, to have those conversations out coming out of this pandemic? Because I feel like, you know, a lot of t- before it was the manufacturers were hesitant to approach some of these larger retailers with, sure. you know, with those, Hey, I, you know, this case pick, we can't do it anymore. Right. So, you know, I feel like that that was a big piece of the the hesitation to try and go back and, and fix some of those things. Do you think that's changing? No, I do think it's changing. I think there's, you know, there's a better platform now to have that conversation we've had in yeah. years. And if you look back, you know, date myself here, but you look back in the mid nineties, a huge initiative was the ECR, the efficient consumer response. Mm-hmm. And it really, you know, there were incentives for full pallets and there, and some yeah. of these are still out there in small, mm-hmm. but it's not, it doesn't drive change. Mm-hmm. Back then it literally drove change. Right. There was enough money in it for a, a retail, a an end customer. Say, so, you know what? That's worth, that's worth right. some money. I'll just order once every other week and I'm going to order a full pallet. Do you think, cause you know, but coming out of the last recession, 2008, right? We were all, you know, we all basically there's a, a, a tremendous amount of skew proliferation. Um, food manufacturers were in a great position. So they were, you know, adding skews to their lines. They were, they were ramping up their volume and with the pandemic and the, the fact that they couldn't get enough people to produce all the products, we saw skew rationalization, right? Sure. Um, and do you think any of that drives some of, Hey, maybe we can now start ordering in full pallets because we just have, you know, we've, we've rationalized- cut some skews right. and yep. we're just going to order, yeah. you know, you know, it's interesting when, the, when it first hit, you know, a lot of the big CPG companies really just canned making some of those right. secondary items. It wasn't yeah. necessarily they cut the skew, but they're right. like, listen, we've got we to get product on the right. shelves. Yep. How do we do it? Yep. So we saw that. And every time this conversation of skew rat comes up and, hey, are we looking to, you know, I think there's that marketing and and side of the food business. It's like, how do we come up with new innovation? Right. Come Absolutely. Up with these, and yep. every time that comes up, it's like, well, we've got to add more SKUs. And mm-hmm. you got this one sales, but I've got this one customer in Sheboygan that wants to get this exact. And so right. you keep this one SKU on there for somebody else. And the plant has to make, you know, three you know right. layers of a pallet every three months for that customer or whatever. I think there's, I think there's definitely more focus on it, but the, I don't know, the, the pessimist or the realist in me is probably saying, <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to see a, a lot of, major manufacturers drop their SKU count. I really don't. You think it's going to come back? Yeah, they're I do. Gonna, I do. They just put them on pause and now they're going to Right, because they've got all these innovative ideas and they're looking at new ways to do things. And that's the way, I mean, if you think about food companies now, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, manufacturing is mm-hmm. sometimes outsourced. you got a co-manufacturer. But the, the one thing that in the, the distribution and the mm-hmm. trucking is all outsourced, but they want to focus on the marketing yeah, side, the, the branding marketing. and yep. all that stuff. Absolutely. So, so that being where most of the employees are in a manufacturing mm-hmm. company, I, I don't see that going away. So that's going to that's gonna continue to rise. And then is that going to end up driving just more case pick? Or do you think we're going to figure <laughs> out a different way? To- <laughs> Good point. <laughs> are we going to figure this out? It's an endless circle. <laughs> it's an endless circle. You know, at least there's more conversations, yeah. I'm going to say, in the last year to it. I think people are more receptive to it. And, and the industry is quite... Honestly, is in a position both on both sides of it. If the warehousing community is able to speak both on the the third party warehouse side and then downstream mm-hmm. at the end, you know, retailer DC to say, hey, listen, we do not have enough people to do this. Right. We can't, you know, we can't work seven days. That was the thing. Oh, we're all going to work seven days a week. We'll set up schedules, and we there's not people to even fill those right. schedules seven days a week. So you might have the equipment and maybe all the other things, but we don't have enough people to do it. And and even when we ratchet up the rates, that mm-hmm. gets people in the door. To, you know, they'll interview and we'll get that started, but. You know, oh, you mean, not, la- you mean in terms of our labor force, right, our workforce? Right. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it excites them temporarily, right. right? But it doesn't necessarily make it more. So the, when you can say, hey, we're going to be in a heated cab going up and down mm-hmm. the aisles, you're not going to be getting out of the cab to, to pick cases all day. Now your productivity is up. Now it's like this is kind of a cool job. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not as freezing. Um, I think those are those are some of the innovations that are starting to help, you know. And so how do you think about automation and what it's doing in our industry and, you know, kind of why now, right? We haven't done it for, I mean, it's been, we've both right. been in the industry for, you know, a, a lot of years. Not I'm quite all, as long. I'm not going right. to date myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's really just been the past five to seven years that we've seen this this explosion of automation. And so what's your perspective on? Yeah, this? I mean, you know, you know, 2003, 2005, you know, people would go over to Europe and go, oh my gosh, we've got to get right. automation. They're yep. doing it, everything. Well, our, our wages were $12 an hour for yep. a warehouseman and theirs were 32. So they had the business case that made sense. Hey, we're, we've, we've yep. got to automate. 
Um, and then the third party sites, when you look at public refrigerated warehouses as PRWs, we would look and say, well, that's a, a cooler customer and that's a frozen customer. And how do we set those? Up? Wait a minute. Cooler pallets are shorter. Frozen pallets are a lot of double stack truck high pallets. So unless somebody's going to sign a 30 year contract right. to pay off my, you know, and nobody was signing up for that. I think there was so much hesitancy because of the inflexibility mm -hmm. of we're going to make that 105 inch openings throughout, you know, and knowing right. that, you know what? There's going to be product that's only 50 inches right. that's going to sit in there and we're going to lose all that density, yep. right? Your wasted space. So I think that was the hesitancy. Yeah. So we put it off as long as we could. But I think we got to a point where we said, it doesn't matter. We don't have the laborers do it. It's right. better to give up. It's better to have warehouses that are less efficient from a space utilization standpoint than it is to have warehouses that don't have enough people to get the product out the right. door. Um, and so I think one thing we've heard is, and this is probably one of the first times we've actually heard this, is that, that you know, our customers, when they think about automation and think about warehouses that are automated, it actually is an advantage if you have those warehouses. And I thought when I heard that, I thought that was very, a very interesting concept because we hadn't heard anybody mention that before. It's sure. just that you just want to get product out the door. You don't care what, you know, you kind of right, don't really right, care what's inside right. the warehouse. But then we heard that it was an advantage and I thought that was interesting. And, and, it, and it depends on who you talk to. <laughs> I so, agree. Um, you know, you know, at our company and, and all of our competitors, it's a journey, right? Automation yeah. is a journey and, and some warehouse, you know, have an automation solution that might take two or three months to get working out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it might take a year, two years, you know, depending on the situation. So I think if you'd ask the customers who are in those buildings going through automation mm -hmm. startups, some might say, I don't necessarily want to be an early adopter. Maybe let's oh. wait down the road. We have some, you know, I've got a couple of customers that were part of automation startups with, with competitors, you know, three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, we're okay if you don't put us in any automation. US right. We want to come to U.S. Coal. We love your brand. We love, you know, the customer service that mm -hmm. you provide. It's okay if you don't put us in an automated warehouse. So it depends on your perspective from what you've seen. Interesting. Um, so when you think about, so, you know, automation is, is you know, we're in the middle of doing automation and being innovative. And we also have all these data science projects. And on the last episode of the cold cast, okay. we talked to Serena Gudapati, who's our VP of IT. And we talked a lot about our digitization strategy. So from business development, from a customer perspective, how do you look at data science and those projects? And is there any, like, you know, where's the opportunity for, to help with customers? Yeah. First of all, we, for so long, we've got, we've acted on intuition, right? We've mm -hmm. just, yep. it's, it's kind of like in baseball when you see how, you know, there's three players on the side of the infield on one side and you got one guy on the right side of the infield. The first baseman's trying to cover everything right. else because it's a right-handed hitter. And we just say, you know, we've taken, we've almost gone too far. We've taken all data science and not taken any of the past knowledge and, and trying to find that blend. And mm -hmm. I think that's when you think about warehousing and, and scheduling appointments yeah, and some of the absolutely. stuff we're doing. And there's so much stuff that we know that, Hey, every time we get an inbound from this customer, we get the 940. 30, so it tells us the pre receipt. Here's what's coming on. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, there's going to be 70 different SKUs and you've got all this breakdowns. You're going to need to set aside four hours for an appointment. I mean, right. that's just one example, how to use the data that you already have. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like when we go to the airport, right? If you're at the airport, and you're like, why is there a three-hour wait at TSA? They know exactly how many tickets it's, were purchased. Exactly. It's frustrating. It is it? so frustrating. <laughs> and then you go other times like, wow, there's nobody here. Why are all these people here? Because you've come at 6 a.m. when all the people are in line. Right. Um, so, again, as a consumer, we just decide, well, I know exactly when I'm not going to go to TSA. I'm going right. to schedule my flights at this time. But it shouldn't be that way. It should be we should use that data. And I'm sure they do. Yeah. But, but as a consumer of the airline industry, mm -hmm. I don't think they do a great job of it at airports sometimes. Um, so it's the same thing. If we've got this data, we've got to use it. And I think mm -hmm. we're finally, we've had data out there for a while. I think we're finally learning how to use it and get more consistent data. So I'm interested to see, I think we're still early on in that journey though. I think there's tons of ways we're going to be able to use that in the years to come. When you think about automation and we, we are going down a path of automation, it is one of our, the pillars of our strategy, right? Definitely. So whether we're doing ASRS in new builds, whether we're retrofitting with layer pick, we have, we have an automation strategy. And so I felt like it was encouraging to hear these customers, you know, say, hey, it does matter because it, you provide a consistent ability to get my product in and out of your facility. Exactly. They know the, I mean, they have the same constraints right. on labor and they, w right. what can we automate? automate? And right. they've automated so much of the manufacturing process. If you think about it, exactly. manufacturing has been automated for many more years, right? So many more, yes. So because they're making the same product over and over right. and, and there's a lot of things you can do with line extensions and, and continue to do that. Whereas in warehousing, it's like, okay, it's a forklift. You get under a pallet, you lift it up and you right. put it away. 
So to see that, it's definitely, and again, it's the big manufacturers. Right. They're the ones that are, they, they look at it beyond just, well, we're just happy. We don't care. Just get the product out the door. Right. They're like, well, we want, how do we minimize risk? Yep. And for them, automation over the long term is a risk. Now, I would say there's probably more risk up front because you're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, with new providers, right. you're integrating ASRS with gantry layer picking. I mean, there's going to be some challenges mm -hmm. with that. So I think the earlier you are in your journey, you might be more frustrated. We've, we've seen some struggles. We've seen some startups that have gone amazingly yes. well. Uh, but that's going to be the challenge as we go forward. How do we shorten that time of startup hiccups with automation, knowing that that's where we're going? We have to. Right. We have to. I mean, you, we've got to get, you know, we've got to get a handle on labor and the labor challenges. What kind of trends are you seeing? from your what are you hearing from your customers where are they where are they changing based on um coming out of the pandemic and kind of where they are with their production yeah you know the pandemic was interesting a lot of us said we, you've got your refrigerator freezer in your mm -hmm. kitchen right and then you might have a beer fridge you know out in the garage or like one of those big chest freezers. or you might have a yeah, chest free well you, you didn't have them right exactly. well you didn't have them because you couldn't get them we couldn't get them <laughs> so that's the whole thing it's like and i'm in the frozen food industry and all these things are going on it's like no. You know, I told my wife, like, we are going to go get a chest freezer. And I don't need chest. We're going to fill it up just in case because we yeah. didn't know. And so when I go, it's like you can't get one. You could go to right. Facebook Marketplace. You could go to eBay, whatever. And they were out the wazoo. Hot commodity, absolutely. So finally, we did find one. I think it was like less than $300. And it was at Walmart. But it, it suited our needs. I mean, we yeah. were able to, you know, and we, and we still didn't fill it up. Honestly. But it's just that whole mentality <laughs> of we're in a pandemic. What do we do? We can yeah. always frozen food. But it's it's interesting that someone who's in the industry – thought that way, but so many people who are yes. not big frozen food foodies that that, that was their first instinct. So yeah. we saw, I mean, if you if you take a few steps back, if you go back to 2012, 2013, frozen food was kind of starting to take it a was. dip, right? So we've got millennials that are like, no, we're gonna be the European model. We're gonna go to the get market fresh. every day and we're gonna get, you know, and we're gonna get fresh food every day. And then they then they had families all of a sudden like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hang on a second. I can't go to the market every day. I've got two kids. And right. so as we've seen, so we've seen that impact just of shopping habits. It's hard to maintain what sounds really great yes. that we can go every, but then we, I, I think the frozen food industry, you know, the American frozen food Institute, mm -hmm. AFI kind of had a, a campaign there in the, you know, after 2013 or so, yeah. you know, and calling it nature's pause button. Frozen food is nature's pause that. button. So it's like, you know, green beans, if you're going to, if it's going to sit, in the produce section for more than a couple of days, and it's going to be another two or three days in your crisper or wherever in your refrigerator, it's a lot healthier if you would have gotten the green beans that were frozen as soon as they were picked. But it's just hard to think that it just seems like it must be better for you, mm -hmm. right? Just intuitively, we just assume it must be better just to let them sit right. you know, in the produce section for days and somehow the nutrients are just as good or better, but they're not. So I think there's been some education that's made a change. I think, again, households and demographic demographics have changed and right so you've got that's not convenient but i think one of the biggest reasons is frozen food has gotten a lot healthier i mean if you think of the tv dinner era of the 70s and 80s right you had enough salt in there to you know were good mashed just, potatoes though Ooh. they were it was awesome <laughs> yeah no we look back on that and that's some of those some of that uh i don't know the food that you have memories with right, right? because you remember those times um, but I think we've realized we can still do frozen food and it can be a lot healthier. And if you look, and so you asked specifically about the pandemic, I mean, you had some skews, ice cream. I mean, ice cream is a still staple. Still has not house. recovered. Yeah. It's, but I mean, it's, it was up 23% mm -hmm. across yeah. the whole year, not just for a few months. Right. I mean, it was they a significant. They could not produce enough ice cream. Right. So you think of that, you think of, you know, we all went to the grocery store and especially, you know, we went to the frozen food section, refrigerated section, and it was empty for a while. But I think one of the cool things was, we got to try, and I'm sure a lot of families did across the country, you tried items that you had never tried before because what you were looking for Wasn't there. was not available. Right, that's true. So it was like, yeah. I got to go, I'll just try this one. It's a right. dollar more. But, and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Right. So next thing you go, you, you try it again. And next thing you know, it's become a habit. Because mm -hmm. we, when we go shop, we're kind of in the habitual mind. It's kind of like when you drive home from work and you, right. know, you look up and, oh my gosh, I'm there. You know, I'm home. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're, you're, you, you don't remember every single turn and all that kind of stuff. And I think what all these studies... People spend so much money in the food world having taste tests mm -hmm. and all these things. And yeah. Tell us about this new product. What are you thinking? You feel like, oh, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. I will buy this. if it's. And you go to the grocery store and there's that. I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to get the one I'm used to getting. So you still stay in whatever is That's, your habit, right? So yeah. to break that habit, I felt like the pandemic actually broke the habit a little bit. Interesting. And, and you tried some new items. So Marty, talk to me a little bit about what U.S. Cold is doing 
now that's different coming out of the pandemic? Yeah, I think when you look at the pandemic, I mean, we've talked about automation, right? That's right. something that we're doing differently, putting a focus on that. I think one of the areas that as an industry leader from a service standpoint, we spend a lot of focus on how do we, you know, it starts with, you know, truck drivers coming to deliver yeah. loads or pick up loads. You know, how do we treat them better? Meaning the the facilities we have mm -hmm. from a customer perspective, how we treat them, but really how quickly we turn their trucks. Can yeah. we get them in and out as fast as possible? And I would think if you talk to the entire industry, regardless, any of our competitors, we've struggled, mm -hmm. you know, the last couple of years because we were just trying to get products out the door right. as best we could. Hopefully full pallets, right? We went back to our manufacturing <laughs> yes, partners and said, can we please, we'll ship your loads, but can it all be in full pallets? Right. And, and we had to do that in some cases we because did. we didn't have the labor to do the case picking. Exactly. So, so when we look at where we've come, it was really just kind of survival mode. Yeah. And yeah. I think we're hoping, I mean, we're still, we're still in a labor pinch. I mean, we're still, every single warehouse in this country, I would say probably still has a sign or should have a sign that says help wanted. I mean, Absolutely. That, you know, I would tell you, we've got a couple hundred in our company mm -hmm. positions available today. So I think the focus though, as we go into 2023 is how do we get back to where we were in 2019 from a service standpoint, you know, we're adding automation. We're looking at the impacts of AI mm -hmm. and how we can get better, but getting back to the basics, the blocking and tackling of our industry. Mm -hmm. How do we more efficiently turn trucks fast? Those KPIs, yeah. inventory management, all those things that sometimes when you're in a pinch, you just do what you can to get it going. Mm -hmm. We've got to be better as an industry. And I, I think at US Cold, we've had those conversations that we're really looking forward to getting back to the basics of what set us apart. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marty, for joining me on today's Coldcast episode. I think we all took away a lot of great information about what's going on in frozen food manufacturing, how we're addressing labor and capacity constraints in the cold chain 3PL industry, and just generally what's happening from a trend perspective with automation and labor and case picking. So Marty, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And to those of you out there until next time, stay cool. Mm -hmm.